Nuclear power is really starting to take center stage right now, with a commitment to increase nuclear energy by threefold in 2050, coming out of COP28 going on in Dubai right now. That really sets nuclear energy center stage as the source of electricity for the future. Welcome to Climate Honesty, where we simplify complex topics to help you be better informed on energy and climate. I know there's a lot of negative feelings about nuclear energy. People associated with nuclear weapons or with nuclear waste that we can't rid get rid of. But let's take an honest look. Let's look at it with uh, open eyes and say, how safe is nuclear? We have 70 years of history of nuclear energy and compared to other forms of electricity generation and see how safe is nuclear really. With COP28 going on in Dubai right now, it seems pretty obvious to me, with all the discussions about climate change and reduction of carbon emissions, there's no way we're going to achieve anywhere near the goals that people are setting out without making nuclear a major source of electricity in the world. As I've said before, wind and solar and batteries are simply not adequate to provide the modern world with the power needed. This leads us to the topic today of nuclear safety. How safe is nuclear, and what is nuclear radiation? Other than the fact that it can turn you into Spider-Man, which would be really cool if it could, or the Incredible Hulk, which might have some negative impacts uh, when you get angry. But other than that, uh, what is radiation? Uh, how does it how does it affect us? How does how long does it last in the soil and that kind of thing? When we're talking about nuclear power safety. There are really just three types of radiation that we're concerned with. One is alpha particles, one is beta particles, and the third is gamma radiation. Alpha particles are made up of two neutrons and two protons and are large and slow and can be stopped easily even by a sheet of paper. Beta radiation is when a beta particle or electron is released from radioactive element and can be stopped by a thin sheet of aluminum foil. Gamma radiation has the shortest wavelength and the most energy of any form of radiation and can travel through most objects with ease. It takes several inches of lead or several feet of concrete in order to stop it. Radiation is measured in terms of a unit called the gray, and that is how much radiation is absorbed by, say, a human body. Now, next we have a unit called the sievert, and the sievert multiplies the gray by a factor determined by how detrimental it is to human tissue. So if it's an alpha particle, it gets multi the gray gets multiplied by 20, and if it's gamma or beta radiation, then it's simply multiplied by 1, and then protons and, and neutrons have their own numbers as well. But those are the numbers that we're interested in looking at. We can compare sieverts to determine the relative risk of different levels of radiation to the human body. I receive a fair amount of radiation just by being alive on the Earth. I receive it externally in forms of cosmic radiation coming from the stars and the sun and from terrestrially, which would be things that are on Earth. Next, I have internal radiation sources where I breathe in particles that have radiation and I eat things that provide radiation. Combining those two together, I get about two and a half millisieverts per year. If I live at higher altitude, I'm going to get more radiation than if I live at lower altitude because I'm closer to cosmic rays and there's less of it filtered out going through the atmosphere. The risk of the radiation doing damage to my cell is multifaceted. There's many things that enter into that, things like where the cell is in terms of its life cycle, what the level of the radiation is, how much there is, what the duration of the radiation, and what type of radiation it is. All these things factor in to whether or not the radiation level that I'm receiving is actually damaging to my cells. The human body is constantly rebuilding itself. So if I spread out the radiation over a long period of time, it really, the body repairs itself as I go along and I can handle long periods of low radiation much better than short periods of high radiation. That's when the damage starts to build up. The same thing happens when I exercise and I get a lot of lactic acid built up. My body has to repair all the damage that was done. And so the same thing is happening with radiation. So radiation is a very naturally occurring thing. The problem with radiation is that if the levels are very high, we can't handle that. 
This is an important concept in talking about nuclear safety because many people feel like any radiation would be bad. Uh, that if we're, if we're getting this radiation from nuclear power or from nuclear energy or nuclear waste, that if we get any of it, it's bad. The problem is that that's just not the case because we get naturally occurring radiation all the time and our bodies are perfectly capable of handling it. So let's take a look at what a lethal dose of radiation would be and compare it to what we get naturally. And we'll also compare that to what we would get living next to, say, a nuclear reactor. Determining a lethal dose of radiation is a complicated task, but it's in the range of 2 to 4 gray. Now, if you remember the sievert, we multiplied the gray by a modifier, and for gamma radiation, which is primarily what we're concerned about here, we multiply it by 1, and so a sievert would be equal to a gray. So 2 to 4 sieverts would be a lethal dose of radiation. Now, if you remember, our terrestrial and our cosmic radiation was about 2 millisieverts, or one thousandth of a sievert. So we would have to get a thousand times more radiation than we get naturally in order to have a lethal dose. What about if I lived next to a power plant, a nuclear power plant? How much radiation would I receive over what I normally get? And the answer is about 0 0.01 millisieverts. And as we looked at, we get about two millisieverts naturally just living on Earth. And so that's one or two orders of magnitude less, which means that it's basically insignificant in terms of a risk factor from radiation. The only concern we might have is if there was an accident. Um, let's take Three Mile Island, for example. No radiation was leaked. There was no level of radiation that came out of the reactor. The only time there has been any significant release of radiation from a nuclear reactor during an accident was during Chernobyl. And Chernobyl was not an, an inherently safe design. As I've talked about in other videos, they were using graphite as a moderator instead of water. We can design reactors so that if everything goes wrong, the reaction simply stops. And that was not the case with Chernobyl. In Chernobyl, if the control systems didn't work properly, the reaction could get out of control, and they did not have a containment dome. And as we looked at uh, gamma radiation, it takes several feet of concrete to stop it. So you need to provide a containment dome over the reactor. Well, that was not done in Chernobyl because of basically finances, and it was really a failure of the Soviet system, not of nuclear power. We have tons of nuclear power plants out there now that are inherently safe. In other words, if something was to go wrong, they would simply stop reacting. Now, Fukushima did actually have some releases due to the giant earthquake and the tsunami that hit it. However, the levels of radiation that the people experienced was fairly minimal, uh, and they checked 100, over 190,000 people, and nobody had any radiation poisoning, and they checked also children to make sure that there was no genetic changes and those have also been proven to be normal. So there was really no significant radiation release even with a giant earthquake uh, that Fukushima experienced. We can say that living and working next to a nuclear power plant or even working in a nuclear power plant is a safe thing to do, that you will not be exposed to excessive levels of radiation living or working next to a power plant. Also, we can say that if there is an upset condition within the plant, we can contain the radiation inside the plant so long as we design the plant to be able to handle that. Well, what about the waste from a nuclear power plant? How do we deal with the waste? Now, that's a great question. There's been a lot of research done in the last 70 years on that and a lot of ways that we can deal with it. Now, the one saving grace for nuclear power is that the amount of waste generated is fairly small. So we can address the issue easier than if we were generating lots and lots of waste. Some countries like England and France reprocess their fuel to make additional fuel. In the United States, we don't do that because there was a fear that you could use those, those reprocessed fuels for weapons. When the fuel rods come out of the reactor, they typically need to cool for several years before we can containerize them and store them permanently. Now, this idea of recycling the fuel is really 
uh, an area where we need to do a lot more exploration and figure out ways that we can continue to use this fuel over and over again. It's possible that if we design our reactor systems where we could take fuel from one reactor and put it in a different style reactor and continue to use that fuel for additional uh, energy creation. Once the fuel has been containerized, right now it seems like the best way to store it is in a geological formation deep inside the earth and then containerized in a way that will last for many, many, many years. This seems to be the best method. There's a bunch of other methods that have been explored, ways of putting it at the bottom of the sea in a, in a soft seabed. That seems to be a very effective way. But putting it in geological formation seems like the most viable and acceptable alternative that we have to date. One of the risks with storing it in a geological formation is the water table. And so any site that is selected needs to be significantly above a water table level. Right now, I think the Nevada site that is planned on being used is 2,000 foot above the water table. So that's really the risk of storing it in a geological formation. The risks associated with a nuclear meltdown are also fairly low. In Chernobyl, there was not even a containment dome of concrete or any way to stop the radiation from, from being emitted. And even now, Chernobyl is safe to go visit. So it's not like it created this exclusion zone for all eternity. It's simply, uh, it simply, uh, it was a bad accident, but it should not happen again. We, uh, if we look at Fukushima, Fukushima, you can go where there was uh, exposed to some radiation, but it was fairly minimal amounts of radiation were exposed and nobody was really injured. So, and same with Three Mile Island, there was no external exposure of radiation. So it's pretty safe to operate a nuclear power plant and not put people at risk. Now to say that nuclear power is without risk would be silly, but no form of electricity generation is. I've been in the uh, energy sector now for almost four decades, and I've been directly involved in a number of incidences where people have lost their lives, and it's, it simply goes with uh, heavy industry. It doesn't matter what you do. Solar cells are dangerous to make, and people die making them. Gasoline and diesel are dangerous to make. A lot of people have lost their lives due to whatever during the process. Uh, I've been out in the field. People get injured digging holes. Uh, it just is part of the world. So when we look at relative risk, nuclear certainly is less risky than almost all of these other forms of power generation. Think about working on a wind turbine 150 feet up in the air. That is a high risk activity. Some people will say yes, but nuclear is a different kind of risk. And that may be partially true, but it's also true that making chlorine for water purification is very dangerous and there have been towns that have been wiped out due to a chlorine leak. Uh, the same thing happens with all kinds of chemicals that we have. We can spill them into waterways and have huge impacts on the environment. Uh, radiation is not as scary if you really understand what's happening as long as we contain the the particles that are giving off radiation, we can control the radiation. It doesn't just escape like chlorine gas would or uh, another type of, of gas that floats in the atmosphere and travels around. So we can contain it just like we contain other forms of chemicals that are dangerous to human life. What about nuclear weapons? Some people seem to think that if we have nuclear power, we will also have nuclear weapons. Well, that's simply not the case. We have nuclear weapons now, and those are not going away. Uh, making nuclear power from uranium does not mean we're going to have more nuclear weapons. Uh, it requires a lot more enrichment of the uranium to make a nuclear weapon, and it's a very, very difficult process to do. Uh, to make a nuclear weapon requires a tremendous amount of technological expertise and a tremendous amount of money and power to make it happen. Also, some people are under the false impression that if I have a nuclear power generation station, if something was to go wrong, it would blow up like a nuclear bomb. And that is simply not the way it works in physics. That, that can't happen. A nuclear uh, reactor cannot blow up like a bomb. Blowing up a bomb is a very specialized form of fission. When you look at the world's need for clean, reliable power 24 hours a day, nuclear is really the only answer that makes sense. Wind and solar don't do that. 
We could have mass battery storage, but that's gonna require a ton of batteries that have a lot of negative side effects. And nuclear is essentially renewable when you consider how many thousands of years we have available to us based on the uranium deposits that we know exist today. Hopefully this video shed a little bit of light on nuclear energy and the risks associated with it, and that you can start to see nuclear power as a truly green, renewable energy source that we could have for thousands of years that could provide us with uh, carbon-free electricity in the future. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Check out my channel for a deeper dive into the topics of energy and climate change.